Just a quick note before the show. As you'll notice, this uh, episode was recorded prior to the release of Beast Grave. Some of the content is uh, slightly dated as a result, but I think we've still got some good content for you. Uh, so enjoy the show. Welcome to What the Hex, your source for Warhammer Underworlds and under 30 glory scored without a single kill. I'm Davey, your co-host, and with me as always, I got Phil. How you doing, Phil? I'm doing all right. All right, and back with us again is Dean. Thanks for uh, thanks for being back, Dean. Hey, thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Uh, so as promised, we are talking hold objective play, and uh, we brought in Dean specifically because that's his preferred style of play, and he's done incredibly well with it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, that later, but uh, as usual, we're going to run through a couple things. Um, in the context of this, this is uh, still recorded uh, shortly after the card rotation has been announced. We don't have any further information on Beast Grave. We know it's coming. We're just not sure when, presumably in the next month. Uh, and that's where we're sitting. We haven't seen any reveals yet, uh, but hopefully soon. You can hit us at uh, Twitter at WTHCast or uh, come come uh, hit us up when we when we fly all over the place on Facebook. Um, community shout outs. And this one, uh, Dean, I'll, I'm, I'm giving a shout out to Jonathan Davis, who you had to, you had to play twice at uh, Nova Open. Um, yep. A uh, great uh, opponent. Nothing but good things to say about him, and uh, congratulations for uh, taking it down. Yeah, not an easy path he took. No, uh, and uh, that I think was his third third match in recent history against you. And I, I remember talking to him after he played you at ATC, and he was like, "Man, he was just felt like he was one step ahead. Like he just had an answer for everything. He was he was. Uh, I know he was very impressed with how you were you were playing, especially with the uh, objective style of play, and that kind of planted the seed for me to." kind of snag you and uh and chat with that since we've uh we've talked to mike carlin about control play uh or, or defensive play as he prefers to call it so uh we'll we'll get you in here for that um we are i think gonna jump in at the time of this recording phil and i still have not made it into our last tournament so that is it um dean people probably remember from last episode you're gearing up for the boys do you have any other smaller events in the meantime or do you just kind of uh only grand clash it I pretty much only go to like the clashes, grand clashes. Fair. Um, all right. Well, we are going over hold objective play. Um, uh, so we're going to be covering like why, why play this style. Um, Dean's going to be the champion of it for us. Uh, we'll talk about some of the war bands you're going to consider. Um, talk about some of the tips for play and counterplay, uh, deck building considerations. And those, those three topics are going to kind of be interwoven because you, you can't really talk about, uh, play without talking about the cards you're using and that gets into decks but and then uh we'll also talk about boards and some of the considerations when you're uh when you're placing objectives and deploying your warband uh well let's kick it off so uh dean you now your brother is all about the aggro like every, every time i've seen him playing he's like <laughs> shoving molog down somebody's throat uh or, or something it was like a that. It was God's War at Nova, but again, he's just throwing dice down people's throat at that point. But yeah, sure. he uh, he plays a much more direct play style, which is kind of funny because our other player, uh, Victor, plays a much more controlling sort of uh, play style. Yeah, he does. I, I got to play him at ATC, and uh, it was, it was uh, clear out of the gate that he knew his control real well. Um, so Yeah, uh, we... we we beat that into him going into the ATC because we made <laughs> had to, uh, <laughs> he he kept playing like we were playing like defensive steel with steely boys for a while and he just uh, would go aggro with it. I was like nah nah you gotta understand you're not moving that's yeah. not your job you're just sitting there Fair. Um, but talk to me uh, so you've been you've been on the hold objective uh, play style uh, what what yeah. drew you to it and why is it uh, why should why should other people play that style uh, the main the main upside to playing hold objectives, which isn't immediately apparent, is that it's not dice-based. It, you don't need a lot of luck to play the uh, Warband at all. Um, in fact, it's you don't need any luck. It's If you're doing it right, it does not matter what you're doing or what your opponent is doing. You don't need to roll dice. There's no randomness in it. You are just trying to execute your game plan. The other side of that is you need to have a game plan, and it is based entirely on the cards that you draw. Mm-hmm. So 
as soon as you draw your cards for the turn, you need to have a plan for every single one of your activations. So you need to be thinking about what you're doing, what most likely your opponent is going to be doing, and making sure that your fourth activation, your third activation, come together the way you need them to come together. Sure. Uh, and I will say that uh, after after seeing you playing at Adepticon and then after uh, talking to Jonathan Davis after he he played against you, I was like, man, I... I I every time I look at objective play, I'm like, I think it looks super hard. So I've I've been on a grind using uh, Thorns of the Briar Queen, which I believe that's what you've done most of your objective play with. Um, all pretty much all of them. Okay. Um, I think it's cl- clearly the best for a lot of intrinsic reasons that mm-hmm. the warband uh, takes advantage of. Um, just a, a lot of hyper mobility baked into the warband. Sure. Um, and uh so i've i've been grinding out a bunch of games just to try and get to to know the play style better there's a side benefit and you probably don't see this as much at the at the very highest levels where people are more practiced against everything that they might see uh but people are often a little less uh experienced with playing against it knowing knowing exactly how it is to disrupt it uh, which gives a little bit of a boost there too they just don't have yes. as, as many of the reps so Yep, and we'll definitely cover that a little bit later as uh, we get some questions that I saw that uh, people had asked related sure. to um, objective play, placing objectives, and that sort of thing. That where you get a lot of advantages. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's give a quick one down to warbands, and we'll start with the Thorns of the Briar Queen because uh, you've you've uh, identified them as uh, the sort of the number one go to choice. And what what makes them what makes them that number one choice? Um. Well, basically, it doesn't. It's not really Briar Queen specific. Um, when you're looking at a warband and what you're trying to do, what you want to do is find the warband that has the highest amount of action efficiency. You only get 12 activations in a game, so you need to make sure that the warband you're picking executes your game plan the most efficiently. And in the case of holding objectives, you need to get on objectives. You don't. You can't start on them. So you either need to find a way to move the objectives, of which there's one card. Um, in the case of uh, Mischievous Spirits, which you really aren't going to get any more than two. Or you need to find ways to move your guys onto them. And that's what the Briar Queens do the best. Uh, Varclav pushes four models, two hexes. Mm-hmm. Which, if you have the three objective board, as long as you didn't make a million mistakes in deploying and putting your objectives down, you should be able to get all of your chain rasps onto objectives on your first activation of the game. Right. Um, similar builds. Um, the goblins are pretty good because they have the scamper, or I think it's scamper. Scurry. 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 Right? Scurry. Yeah, that's the one. So there's the one board where you can deploy like three models right next to each other. So you can get three walks on activation one to get on the objectives. Um, that makes them pretty good at it as well. And Sepulchral Guard, if you're looking as a... A notable inclusion, they get to take a two walks, which is a lot worse than four pushes and also slightly worse than uh, goblins walking around because you can chain the goblins a little bit better if you set it up. Sure. Um, and I guess notable, notable inclusions, well, honorable mention would be the dwarves because they have Seek the Sky Vessel. So you can kind of catch some people off guard if you Seek the Sky Vessel onto some objectives and just score supremacy out of nowhere. Yeah, I uh, I will say that I played uh, while I was trying out my thorns. I tr- played against Zach Newcomb, and he included supremacy in his profiteers deck, uh, and that was pretty rough because if I uh, if I lost boards, I knew that he could get three glory, get his engine started, and then come after me. Um, yep, and- it's a it's kind of a neat trick that they're allowed to play because you don't expect that they're usually a very heavy score immediately deck with very th- few things other than superior t- tactician that score more than one glory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, any other uh, any other dark horse candidates in there, or anything um, that uh, uh, you think is worth trying sometimes to surprise people? I don't really think so. Again, you really need to have a, a minimum threshold of mobility, which I don't think that any other faction has to move things onto objectives, um, or even just the model count. You'd really want to be able to hold objectives while taking losses. Sure. Uh, I I always feel like eyes could get there, uh, partly because you can get you can get the uh, horror in uh, in a lot of different places. And they have some of those uh, those gambits that let you uh, 
pop around the board surprisingly. But I, uh-huh. I think I think where it falls short, and, and I I don't know if I put I don't know if I put words to it until you're talking there is that the action efficiency of getting the horror into place and then moving that horror is really low. Um, so, exactly. Uh, it'll take you two actions to get the horror somewhere, presuming you don't have cards. Yeah, I, yeah. I think the minimum barrier is you need to have supremacy in your deck if you're going to play objective based. And how efficiently can you score supremacy? Mm-hmm. And if it takes you any more than two activations to score supremacy, you're you're not really a good candidate for um, the hold objective style of play. That's a good point. Um, all right. Well, let's. Uh, what do you think? We, we jump into uh, tips for for playing, or do you want to start with uh, boards and placement? Um, um. Yeah, we can just talk about boards and placement. Okay. Um, well, tell me. Um, in, in my in my experience, uh, it has been generally easier for me when I lose boards. Had just having the three objectives near me has been advantageous. So I, I really got to turn my brain on when uh, when I've won boards, which is to say that I get to orient them. But uh, do you find those equally uh, difficult, or one easier than the other, or preference for one, or are you at this stage where they're they're both pretty good? Uh. If you lose boards, you, my win percent is something like 90%. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I lose boards, it's uh, much, much closer to 50, 55. Okay. All right. So it's a huge, huge, huge advantage to have the three objectives because it forces your opponent's play style to change immediately. And they are immediately playing on your playing field. They have to come to you. They have to move in a way that uh, is advantageous for you. Whereas otherwise you really rely on ploys and uh, a lot of different things to get you to the objectives on the other side of the board. So uh, before we talk specific boards or anything like that, uh, talk to me what, when you are, uh, and you can, you can put this in the terms of uh, winning boards versus losing boards, but what, what are your uh, primary considerations when you're picking which board you're going to lay down? If I've lost the board, I like to play um, in the, the board that has the three, uh, the opposite of Arcane Vortex, whatever the other side of that one is, the three blocking hexes and the little diagram in the middle, the little triangle in the middle. That's the board I all, always give out first. It's the Soul Refractor, I think. It's the three like columns or whatever, pillars. Is that is that the one? Sure. Sure. I yeah. think so. Yeah. Yeah, um, it just it gives you a lot of uh, defense against all of the the range decks and spells now that they include line of sight. Mm-hmm. So you can you can always hide an objective in the middle section there, which gives you some cover, and you can often get uh, one of the objectives going behind another one as well. So uh, that's always the one I give out first, and uh, after that I just try to figure out you know which other board has enough blocking or lethal hexes to make it ad- advantageous to me since I don't care about lethal hexes or blocking hexes at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about when you've won boards? What are you, uh, what are your considerations and what, what board are you reaching for? Um, if I've won the board and I'm playing against the dwarves or any heavy ranged war band, I always go for the, uh, it's the orange board that has the two, blocking hexes and one lethal hex um so man i wish i knew the names of the boards but uh yeah this is the animus forge we're talking about then yeah so it, it's kind of fiery yep it's an mm-hmm. orange orange red board yeah okay yeah um and when we were testing for the atc we very quickly discovered that that board is the dwarf killer um mm. So it doesn't matter what you're playing. Like if we were playing Molog, uh, Cursey Boys, or Briar Queen, if we're playing against Dwarves, that is the board we take when we've won. Because it, if you get to orient their board, you give them one uh, deployment spot that's even close to because uh, you offset them mm-hmm. um, as cool. much as possible. So there's three connecting hexes. Yeah, it gives them one hex, and it usually uh, Floaty Dwarf goes on that one, and the rest of their guys are two activations at minimum before they could even take a shot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're, so, you're placing them with the block Texas closest to their board. Uh, exactly. Really, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, so the only thing they can do against that is, you know, hidden paths or some other movement shenanigan to get them to the middle of the board. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of the dwarf players were playing that new teleport to teleport them. Uh, no step. man's land. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. It, and obviously it scores shortcut as well. So, uh, it's very easy to play with hidden paths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I, I just sort of 
dumb lucked my way into this board. I, I'd, I'd been doing a lot with that, uh, the one you were talking about, the solar refractor with the three columns, playing with that some, uh, and then had been trying the molten shard pit with the big lava pit there, uh, but then just happened to throw this one down and discovered, yeah, like I, I do like it a lot, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a strong pick. So it sounds like your your goals with your board selections here are uh, slowing down aggro, right? Like you're you're finding ways to slow them down either by being far away or by making it hard for them to draw a line of sight if they're if they're uh, bringing something that's higher than uh, range one. Yeah, you just want to protect your chain rest as much as possible. They only have one dodge dice. It's likely not going to get better if they're sitting on an objective and they've got two wounds. So pretty much anything that looks at them is going to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, especially in the Shard Gale heavy meta that uh, was present at Nova. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, jeez. That uh, <laughs> gives me the cold sweats. Um, any other boards? So uh, both those boards look like you've got a, you've got a strong first candidate for um, winning, but at the very least you're going to have to have a second candidate for each of those because uh, you're going to have yep. to play two games to switch. So any, anything else you reach for next on either of those? Uh, Arcane Vortex, the opposite side of the Refractor, just the three lethal hexes. Mm-hmm. If they're playing an aggro warband or not a ranged warband, it's just great to, if you lose the board, you mm-hmm. can just give that to them, and there's no real way that they can put it advantageous to them. You always have spots when they come in to push them into the uh, lethal hex. Mm-hmm. And the other one, similarly, if they're not a ranged warband and they're playing, uh, and I've lost, or I've won the board, it's the grouping of three lethal hexes in a row, and I just angle that right into the three slot opening. Yeah, uh, and just that push them into. Yeah. And that there's a uh, if they're coming through that, not only they're running past that lava pit, but they uh, and then are in danger of getting pushed into it. But there is uh, all your starting hexes are pretty far removed from that. Which uh, yes, which exactly. Time, so. Yep, right. and also you do have one guy with knockback, clever, clever, big lover, and he loves pushing people multiple hexes through that lethal <laughs> stuff. Yeah, the uh, I would ask you for your third candidate for each, but I think you don't often go to three games, so that's usually not an issue. Uh, yeah, and, I, and even if you do, it's I don't think I've ever won three or lost three ever sure. since Adepticon, so I don't really have. And Adepticon, you didn't have to have didn't have to pick three different boards, so you just pick the same one every time. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so the next thing once boards are down is uh, is placing placing your objective tokens and so. Oh, go so ahead. I do. I did have a just sort of a question. It's not necessarily related to strategy, but something that I've heard people kind of ask for, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on it. Being a heavy objective player, um, should the roll off be a choice that you get to choose whether or not you place boards versus get the objectives or should it be a fixed thing with whether or not you won the roll? Um, I don't think it matters. Um, the, the, Cause the change that I would like to see is if you, whoever went, got to choose in the first game doesn't get to choose in the second game and then you roll off for the third again. Sure. And I, and I don't, and I think that's the only, that's the biggest fix I would change for competitive play because um there are just some war bands that benefit so significantly. Like I said, I'm, and I'm not joking about 90% when I have the three objectives. It's really that high. That's the only game I won against uh, John in the finals <laughs> was when I had the board. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, that's really that's the one change I would make. And once you have that, it doesn't really make any difference, like the choice, because for most war bands, they don't care whether you get to choose or you get to because if you you win. That's the same as winning the other way, right? You get the choice to win. You're going to choose to win unless you're playing objectives and you're going to choose to lose. So it's a yeah. it's a slight change. You could do it, but I don't think it makes much difference. I, I think my only my only argument in favor of making people choose is that there's some where it's a little hard to, to tell, and I think that just gives another, uh, uh, another decision point that uh, goes in favor of the person who's identified the matchups uh, better, but by and large, the the choice is often pretty clear. So yeah, uh, particularly from someone like you coming from the uh, hold objective play style. Um, so uh, so next thing is happening is we're putting down objective tokens, and and this is you know something without visual aids uh, is is difficult to really describe. But I, there's some considerations you're making as you're as you're placing these right, and what. Um, what are you keeping in mind as you're putting them down? Again, whether you have three or two. 
Um, the first thing you're doing is you're just seeing how the board was laid out. So if you won the board, it's much easier. You already know, you're already visualizing when you're arranging the boards where your objectives are going to be. Mm -hmm. But if you've lost the board, you just need to figure out where you can place the first one that doesn't conflict with the second one that lets you put the third one as far away on an edge hex as, as possible. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a little bit of like angling to do that. Um, so, which leads into the question, can you counter this by putting an objective on my board to mess up where I was planning to put my objectives? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah. You absolutely can put an objective in a spot where I don't want it that denies me the ability to put an objective or even two objectives down. But the reality of that is once you've done that, I now have an extra objective on my side of the board. And that advantage is much bigger than the advantage you got by denying the exact placement that I wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this happened a lot um, against Ivan Cho who I also played twice at Nova um, apparently he's the top ranked <laughs> Underworlds player in America or whatever right now uh, he's also, I've played him before in 40k he's just a very very competitive and very solid player I think he ended up taking 7th um, mostly after taking a couple losses from me but uh, yeah he placed a lot of objectives on close to me on my side of the board to kind of disrupt my play. And he also was worried about me feign weighing or whatever, going to the objectives in the back where he couldn't contest me or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that's, it's a very logical line of thought. The issue is that once all the objectives are on my side of the board, my game plan is much, much easier to execute. Sure. I can now, I can now charge you and end up on an objective because you have to come to me anyway. Um, things like that. So there's really, there's almost no advantage to giving an objective player an extra objective. In fact, I would say it's a negative advantage. Just don't do it. Um, yeah, that's about all I can say about that. Um, just makes my game plan so much easier to execute, especially when I'm playing objectives like 1, 4, 2, 5, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just having the chance of having more of those where I have easier access is just going to make my scoring happen so much faster and easier. Yeah. Uh, for me, I was noticing uh, a couple considerations is whether you're playing thorns or whether you're playing goblins or, or something else uh keeping in mind how it is you're getting onto these objectives so early on i was making the error where i'd place them in what seemed to be a good spot but then i'd realized that i'd placed uh one of them more than you know more than two hexes away from a starting hex so all of a sudden i can't get there in a single push and i really wasted some efficiency or yeah I had one of those in my first game against John, and it was just like it was—it's super embarrassing when it happens. <laughs> or I deployed like a model that couldn't be pushed next to the objective. It was just like, oh my goodness. Yeah, exactly. So I've I've done that, I, and I find uh, I've done a little bit of this with goblins as well, where you know it'll be something like, oh no, like obviously Sour Tongue the fanatic is not going to go stand on this objective. Like that's bananas. Like that doesn't make sense. Or, <laughs> Or you know, or yeah, it, it, that that's a board that gets crowded real quick. Is the is the uh, goblins, um, as as hard as it is to think of where everyone's going with the ghosts, uh, goblins are sometimes more challenging in that respect. But yeah, I've I've, I've done exactly yeah. that same thing. Like, oh well, Varklav's not going to push himself two hexes. That's uh, not great. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and that kind of leads back to uh what i was saying from sculpting your entire turn from your opening hand is you also need to like because you draw your cards and then you place your models right mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah so you need to like figure out like what your game plan is to get to the objectives on the other side if they you need the a, a full one four or two five or whatever else so you need to visualize and have that game plan for instance in my final game against john I uh, I had commanding the one that lets you put a guy on guard or push them one hex. Inspired but not command. Really sure. Yeah, inspired yeah. command. That's the one. And I had that in my hand, and I went to deploy, and I put the Briar Queen one like one hex away or two hexes away from his guy, so like one hex would put me adjacent to them. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, all right, so I'm going to push the Briar Queen next to this. She's going to inspire, and I'm going to go kill Garrod. <laughs> And then I picked uh -oh. my hand back up and went, that's not sidestep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So if that was the ever hang, it's a very different story. So you got to really just, you have to really be on your game because every loss in efficiency for you is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Like if it takes you two activations to get somebody an objective because you didn't put them close enough to be in the two hex push or whatever from Barclav, now you've wasted an action. You've lost almost 10% of your action economy 
and that's huge for you. Your opponent is just, they're not even going to really notice that you did it, but they're going to get huge bonuses from, from doing nothing. Sure. Which is the real downside. That's the real downside of playing the objective play is every decision you make has huge ramifications for every other decision that you're allowed to make in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, The only other things I can think of that I I kept in mind when I was placing, if I had something, you know, you have your ideas on where the objective is going down. If I had the option to place an objective adjacent to a block text, I'd do that. Uh, It did a couple things where that was one less spot that they could charge to. Uh, Often it would mean they have to go the long way around something to, to get at you. And it would uh, it would mess with range two and range three fighters who may not be able to draw a line of sight. Just made it that a little bit harder. Um, yep. And slightly less effective is place it next to a lethal, and then uh, if they uh, again they have to damage themselves on the way in or or attack you from something adjacent to it, and then your briar queen or someone else can come uh, attack him and push him in to that lethal. Right. So uh, punish yep. him for getting close to it. Yep, and that's all things you got to consider when you're placing the objectives and choosing your board even is just making sure you have a lot of defensive options because the reality is your chain rests are not going to live for very long once they get attacked. So you have to be able to efficiently punish the opponent for moving in on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, well, let's, uh, unless we got anything else we want to talk with, uh, with uh, objectives, uh, placement, or uh, deployment, uh, we can move on to... Uh, deck building or uh you want to do go to play tips is that what's your what's your preference there i i guess i uh one one last question i have about objective placement is uh does does the existence of some of the tech that um the uh, iltharis guardians have affect any of what you want to do or do you just let them do their game plan and not worry about it um with Specifically, the Atharis Guardians, I'm just not going to worry about it. The Warband completely disappeared once the magic fac or a mag- the magic uh, dampening happened, the recent restricted list. They just, they're just they just so much less efficient than uh, even Storm Sires, so there's just no reason to play them anymore. Um, that'll change, obviously, going forward, but for right now, I don't see any reason to play them. So their specific card of getting on an objective and killing it, even that... They only they only get two objectives or three objectives, and then they're just picking randomly which of the ones that they think matters. Mm-hmm. The one that's really problematic is the actual spell Abasoth's uh, of withering, unmaking. Unmaking. Abasoth's unmaking. unmaking. Yeah. Yeah, because that one could just kill an objective from underneath you, one that you've already claimed, you've already wasted AP to get onto, mm-hmm. and yep. AP being action points. Sorry. Um, so. Yep. <laughs> yeah, like. That's that's the big one that can be very punishing, but luckily most people have stopped playing it. Um, a lot of the mat once the magic dampening happened, uh, a lot of people moved away from just a critical mass of spells. Don't don't they also have a card where it's it's an upgrade where if a fighter is with this upgrade is holding an objective, no one else in that territory is considered to be holding an objective. I think they have something like that. Yeah, I don't think uh, I've ever seen anyone use it, but I just wonder if it. Uh, plays I, into i think it's no one at all not no one else so not even they can are considered to be holding an objective in that territory yeah yeah that's exactly what it does um so it's really just a counterplay <laughs> yeah i think it's just too narrow for them to be playing um there's just so many more like again i'm like the only me and i think randall from uh, battle for salvation played objective play out of 60 something players or whatever so yeah it's just not worth it. You're just you're kind of handicapping yourself for no real reason. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it's a uh, it's targeting something that you're just not running into enough. It's it's too specific. So let's uh, let's let's talk uh, gameplay tips uh, and counterplay. So uh, we already know that your sort of your core assertion is that uh, get get into position to score supremacy with as few activations as possible. Uh, yep. Is, are you doing this, are you trying to do this right away in the round or are you sometimes waiting till later in the round or what's, what's your, what's your thought process on when, when to make your move uh, on, on that? Um, it de- really depends. Um, as again, you, if you're looking at your hand and it's got to play out a certain way, you're going to be taking the Varclav push at some point. So, 
really it's where do you want the Everhang to be and when do you want them to get there? Because your chain rafts are going to go on the objectives. The Everhang is going to go downfield. So you, the Everhang, when I push, he always goes towards the enemy, um, unless I'm playing very defensive for some reason. Like if they're an actual melee aggro warband like uh, Reavers, Magor, or Molog, then I'll be pushing away. But uh, so if it's the first activation and I'm not doing anything else, because there's not something to attack, there's not somewhere I need to be, I don't need to do anything else, obviously the push is the first thing that happens. Um, but sometimes it makes more sense to attack, or it makes more sense to charge, or something else. Like, if you're playing Godsworn, you can just kill some of them. Or if the dwarves didn't deploy very well, and Garrod or uh, Iron Hail is within range of a charge from Briar Queen, who is always on the front line against the dwarves, mm-hmm. you just get to kill that model before it gets to activate sometimes, some percentage of the time. Which sure. is obviously what you want to be doing instead. So it, you don't. It's not always happening first. It's not always happening last. It's just really how the flow of the game is going. Like sometimes you need to push to get the bright or the everhand closer so that he can charge something that's six hexes away rather than four. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, it, in my experience, a similar thing. I think uh, not being as experienced a player with it, I would do it pretty early. Uh, what I'd find would be a problem is that a, a real cagey player would. Uh, would move on to, would find a way onto one of the objectives that I was going to try and grab. So I think uh, if I identify that they might, they might get all the way onto one of the objectives I needed, then I was going to try and grab it earlier by sitting on it. Uh, it meant that they had to, they had to bump me off. Um, if they managed to get on it, then all of a sudden I'm in trouble because I have to spend an act to, I have to spend resources, a card, or I have to spend an activation to get them off of there, and then I still am in the hole in activation to get back on it. Um, yeah. Without the, or or again overcome it with cards. But uh, so I I was finding that um, when in doubt, I had some value in getting getting there first if I thought there was a chance that they were going to try and get there um, early. Yeah. If if their plan is to get on the objective in some fashion for whatever reason, and especially if you're on like the game two or game three and they've shown that they're willing to do that, then yeah, you want to get on as soon as you can. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, the the hexes and or the objectives in your base are, are pretty much never under threat. So you kind of want to wait till things play out to really move on to the objectives on to their side, especially if you can somehow roll the two crits required to get to go first uh, or yeah. make them go first, rather. Oh, yeah. So that's another good thing. So you're you're... We talked about this in our rule of thumb, what your preference is to go uh, first or second. In the in the first round, uh, are, are you attempting to go second every round, or are there times where you, where you uh, buckle down and, and actually choose to go first? Second, pretty much every round. Um, you're going to have some number of supremacies, whether they're tactical supremacies or the real thing. And you want to be able to get on an objective on their side of the board without getting retaliated against, or even on your side of the board, without getting retaliated against for the last activation. You want to have the final say, if it's at all possible. Sure. Uh, and the final say is, is a big deal here, because your final say can either be what you have in your power hand, or it can be an activation plus what you have in your power hand, and that's a that's a big swing, right? Yeah, exactly. So sometimes you're allowed to, like, you know, charge something, uh, play a play a thing ready for action, which lets you walk onto an objective or something. Right, exactly. Uh, it just uh, it puts less pressure on on the resources in hand. I think the only time I was ever finding that I was, well, the only time I, I should say is not the only time I'm first because sometimes I, I would take the first activation and then inevitably regret it because it'd be like, oh man, like if I go first and the queen might take this fighter out and that'll really take the pressure off other stuff and then she'd inevitably miss and I'd be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Control. Every time, every yeah. time, or, or you 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 set this whole plan. It works. You kill whatever you were looking to kill, and then you just get plinked off an objective, yeah. and you lose supremacy or whatever. Yeah, I almost almost always end up regretting it. I think the only times I I didn't are times where I've already scored supremacy, our only way out, uh, and I know either that the attacks are are too deep, or I've mulliganed them, or you know I I know that I only have one one or two of them left, and they're they're not in play on this particular move but uh um that's a pretty rare occurrence by and large yeah i think uh go second yeah especially if you're playing martyred because there's a lot of times you're forced to go first and you're not you just have martyred in your hand and you just can't attack Mm -hmm. 
Well, let me tell you this. Uh, let's say, let's say, as is often the case, because you are such a large warband, whether you're playing goblins or ghosts, uh, you've been made to go first. Um, you're playing against something aggro, something you're expecting to kind of come running at you. Uh, what what often is that first? What are you looking at for that first play there? Um, if they made me go first, we're just yeah. going to Varclav push away. Yeah, buddy. Varclav push away <laughs> or, or towards. If you're holding the martyred, give them something to eat. Mm-hmm. You know, get your objective or your glory started so you can start buying upgrades. Okay. It sounds like you are doing something with the uh, Everhanged. You're using Ever, the Everhanged as the, as the uh, person who dives in. Is is that because of the high speed on the Everhanged, or is it uh, because he's got offensive output? Uh, it, do you consider him a distractor, or or someone to grab uh, enemy objectives, or, or both, or what's the what's the concept there? Uh, both basically. Uh, in a lot of cases, he's getting pushed forward so that he can charge and end up on their objective on their side of the board. Mm. Yeah, that's. Go that's ahead. the big plan is you have you get six hexes of movement that way so you kind of want to deploy them in a spot that six hexes gets you on their objective sure um do you so let's say he goes down early do you is the is the queen kind of a substitute for this role i mean hurt because she can't she can't uh get varclav pushed um but i've, I've also found using her they end up spending a lot of energy trying to bring her down and uh, meanwhile you're still collecting things up with Varclav and the Rasps. Yeah, she does draw a lot of attention, probably more attention than she really deserves um, in a lot of cases because she's not that good of a model in a lot of cases. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, but she does draw a lot of attention, which, and she takes, she weathers a lot of fire with four wounds and two dodge dice, so it's mm-hmm. great that she does draw that amount of attention. So she is like your backup, uh, their side of the board sort of model. Like your chain rafts aren't doing anything in Varclav, you have to kind of protect a little bit because you can't have them going down without doing a couple pushes. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's uh, is there? Let's try to translate that a little bit to another warband, like with the with the Gits. Uh, do you consider a, a model that kind of fills some of the same role, um, or is or is that uh, something they're they're lacking as far as that goes? Well, you can get. You mean as far as the Briar Queen or as far as the Everhanged? Yeah, as far as uh, someone to go into enemy territory, um, act as a distractor, maybe claim an enemy objective. Oh, yeah, then you're looking at uh, Sour Tongue or uh, Drizget? The, Driz- uh, the squig- handler. Squig herder? Yeah. yeah, the Squig Herder. Yeah. yeah, those two guys, you want to just get over there and have them start taking fire. The and what I found with the Gits is uh, you're really not playing a lot of specific objectives. You're just playing Supremacy, Our Only Way Out, and a whole bunch of keys. Mm. Yeah. So you're really not looking to uh, get specific objectives until the end of the game when uh, whatever model you have left is standing on whatever objective is nearby mm-hmm. just to get that extra glory. Mm-hmm. So the rest of the game, you're just trying to distract them hopefully not kill anything that matters too much. You don't want to lose your leader and you don't want to lose, uh, well, I guess you really don't care about losing too much. So you're just trying to keep them occupied with things that don't matter while you set up your end game scoring. Sure. And I guess yeah. Sour, Sour Tongue has this side benefit of, uh, he can lay some damage on, but he can, in the same activa- act, in the same activation, bump somebody off an objective and, and occupy get onto it. it. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, he actually is a very solid objective runner and, and doesn't die too easy either with uh, all the dodge dice that he gets. Sure. Uh, and I found that uh, stacking stacking defense dice, uh, it's, it almost acts as more of a deterrent um, than it is actually effective, right? Somebody sees three defense dice and their chances are probably not quite as bad as they think they are, but it just, like, it they, they don't take the attack because it feels bad, right? Yep, that's exactly how it ends up working out. Um, if you're going to put dodge dice on things, you want to put them on uh, Briar Queen or Varclav or even the Everhanged. Things that have two dodge dice are likely going to have two dodge dice. Mm-hmm. And everything else, you want to have sudden growth. Sudden growth or uh, deathly fortitude. Right. Going forward, just sudden growth, I guess, because the other one will be leaving. But uh, mm-hmm. as far as defense, it just makes your chain rest. They can't, they can't one-shot them with pretty much anything. So uh, the idea being, it's just going to hold the objective forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, how about redundancy? Here was another thing that, that uh, came up for me. So if I was worried about getting pipped off, like if especially especially if I knew I was playing against a deck that was uh, 
rocking that has the ability to rock a double distraction. So, uh, Molog or, um, steel hearts or, or in, any of these war bands that they can double up on those. I would try to get myself on four or even five objectives with the idea that, uh, they're going to engineer a way, get me off some of them, um, be it yep. through attacks or cards. Uh, and that just gives me that extra buffer than, um, I don't know. So I found that more important in some matchups than others, but is that, that's probably something you're looking forward to. Yeah. You pretty much, if you have the opportunity to get on an objective or not, you should always choose to end up on top of the objective at the very least. It, uh, you can't, it keeps you from losing supremacy by getting planks in one direction or something else. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, I wouldn't sacrifice, um, better positioning or other glory opportunities to end up on an objective. Sure. Um, Even if that would cost me supremacy at the end of the turn, pending distraction or whatever else. So don't, don't play in fear of the, uh, the distraction uh, at the expense of scoring other glory. Exactly. So if you, like if you have the opportunity to walk onto an objective to just make sure you have it, or you have the opportunity to charge something and get a kill for, or even just like score a change of tactics or something else, probably better to do that. Mm-hmm. Just get the glory wherever you can get it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, bearing in mind that, uh, keys are about to go away as, uh, keys are uh, another so one one advantage of of uh hold objective decks is that uh ignoring the keys even they have a very high glory ceiling like that if you add up all the glory a lot of times they they have a ton in there um and that gets even crazy higher with keys and i think this is something that i've noticed you know of uh when when people are at grand clashes i'll be checking in i think we were watching uh, watching your scores at ATC and then watching them at other things. And you'd be blowing people out with these huge glory differentials. Uh, and some of it's just because uh, some of that means that you can, you can, you know, rack up those huge glory differentials on, on some of your wins. And some of it is that if it's a race, you can still race, even if they're scoring a whole lot, you know? So um, yeah, it all, go ahead. It, it's a tertiary benefit that you're not mentioning is that in the uh, current scoring system, just having, huge differentials or whatever is what you want to be putting down. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter that you won. It matters that you won by a lot. Cause then you get paired into ideal. I'm just, I'm going to say weaker opponents because on paper they're weaker. They're, that's not always the case. It just might be somebody who had a bad game or they had a close game against a good opponent or whatever. But often you'll find that you, if you have your highest glory, it's paired against the lowest glory mm-hmm. in the same bracket. So you end up with uh, a easier track on paper. Fair. Um, well, and so going back to the keys though, uh, and this, this is a, this is one I've particularly struggled with is, uh, I, I don't often put a whole bunch in there just cause I, I am not good enough at playing them. How many, uh, and this gets into a little deck building, but how many, how many keys do you like to include? Um, zero two, all of them. I usually play, I've only played two. There was a, I think at ATC I played three. But uh, I only played two. I only played the ones that overlapped with the supremacies that I was playing at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a pretty solid number. You really can't afford for a lot of your upgrades to be dead. And in fact, I think I'll probably even do better once I lose the keys and I get to put real <laughs> upgrades back in. <laughs> right. <laughs> Things well, that matter for more than the not even game actions, you know? So here's where here's where keys uh, were difficult for me is um, you're sitting you're holding them in your in your hand and it's the second round. Um, are you putting that key out or are you? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm I'm slamming it if it's the end of turn one and I have it in my hand. I'm gonna score whatever glory and I'm gonna put it on. Usually I put it on Barclav. Sure. Because he's so far from the the fight and especially if I haven't seen Fainway yet because mm-hmm. I can just like put Fainway on him and get him to go wherever I need him to go at the end of the game. Fair. Is um, usually the plan. Better to see more power cards at the expense of maybe not scoring that key. Yeah, especially if it's a key on their side of the board or something else. Um, sure. Better to just put it on a model that's a little bit less likely to die and can possibly get it for you. That makes sense. I think I played 2 KG. I'm worried about uh, not scoring it. But the thing is, like, if if I lose the game before it even gets there, then it doesn't matter whether I score it or not, right? So. Right, exactly. And also, it kind of puts a target on the head of the model that has it. So, like, all right, now I need to kill Varklav. And usually Varklav has four four to six wounds with two to three dodges. So it's just, like, a, something they want to kill, but they really can't 
kill at the end of the day. Um, yeah, let me, well, so let me cycle back. Uh, let's talk a little counterplay with your, when you were saying, uh, as long as you're not sacrificing other glory, uh, better to end up on an objective than not. Uh, do you feel like that's true for counterplay or, uh, is that, uh, is that usually too hard for, uh, the, the, the other side? Uh, I'd say it's the same thing. If you can charge or end up in a spot that leaves you on an objective, definitely do it. A hundred percent do it. It makes absolute sense to do that. It causes nothing, I mean, nothing but problems for you to be on any number of objectives. But at the same time, if your action is literally to walk on an objective that I'm not on, and that's your action, like I'm, I'm thrilled for the mm-hmm. most part that that, that mm-hmm. happened. Um. All right. Uh. What What other What are the things you find with counterplay that? Uh, I mean, so obviously, one would be is often had the uh, the opponent having you go first so that they get the they deny you that last activation. Are there other other things that when you see on the other side of the table, like, ah, this person has a good sense of how to play against a hold objective style? Well, I I can really speak from recent experience and uh, all of the people that uh, really came to win came to beat me. Uh, Like, Amon came to beat me. John came to beat me. They're both playing Shard Gill. They're both playing a ton of things that plank plank for one damage. Like they just they turned bad matchups into nightmare matchups. <laughs> so if you're looking to beat hold objective play, like I don't know what it's going to look like going forward because Shard Gale's obviously rotating. But uh, at that specific tournament, the the way to make it a nightmare if you have a ter- an event coming up soon, just play Shard Gale and any <laughs> amount of like things that do one damage. Um, sure. So if you're just playing dwarves, you get to kill anything. Everything yeah. dies to one shot now. Or if yeah. you're playing a spellcaster. The uh, Ivan was playing literally every spell that did one damage. Like we're talking Seget Salvo. Oh, nice. And uh, there's like encroaching darkness or something. Be on an edge hex, take a damage. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Stand, yeah. stand yeah. an objective, take a damage. Like oh my goodness, what is happening here? Yeah, I was. Uh, I played against a uh, Condemners deck that was using Shard Gill, Encroaching Shadow, Lethal Ward, uh, all for the chip damage and has double distraction. And I was like, yep. "Whoa, this got really, really hard uh, in a yep. hurry." So, and if uh, you if you have things that plink for one damage in, in addition to Shargale, that's really the the hardest counter to the list because you just lose all of the things that hold objectives for you, and then most of your objective pile is just dead. Yeah. Um, Phil, you got any other questions about play counterplay or Dean? Got anything uh, before we move on to deck building? Nope. Uh. The only things that I've been wondering about um, kind of apply to deck building, um, so I'll, I'll probably tack those on at the end of that. Okay. Uh, so for deck building, since we were already talking keys, I'm going to uh, – actually, we'll put that uh, – we, we were talking you, – you mentioned it several times that you're having some of the tactical supremacies. So that's uh, mm-hmm. hold 1, 2, hold 3, 4, 2, 5, 1, 4. Uh, some combination yep. of those looking for an overlap. Uh, you can usually get a, a couple overlaps with how you play them. Uh, Matthew Martin is asking, you go, um, do you go all in? I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff Osborne was asking, do you go all in on the tactical supremacies or what, uh, do you think it's stronger to include those or what's your, what's your sense of those? Uh, I kind of waffled around a little bit on that. I ended up playing three of the four, uh, tactical supremacies. I do think that that's, uh, they're very, very important cards, and they're not too difficult to score in a lot of cases, especially for the the Briar Queen. We've been talking a lot about the pushes, but they also have a lot of other movement. Uh, they can just appear the sudden appearance. Um, mm-hmm. Then you have just the things that everyone else has access to, yeah. uh, hidden paths and the like. There's a lot of ways to get to that side of the board. Yeah, I found uh, with the Briar Queen, Inescapable Vengeance ended up coming in clutch a few times because she'd charge somewhere, then you could sidestep where you needed to go or whatever. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And back when I was playing Confusion, that also came up a lot. Like, if the opponent would stand on an objective to deny it from me, I could just charge over, attack something else, or not even to charge, just walk over and then Confusion my way on. Mm -hmm. You know, just to keep yourself there. Yeah, they would always set up a weird situation where, like, I'd be nice to attack them, but I don't want to accidentally like kill them and then not be able to get on right. confusion. But yeah. yeah, definitely don't want to kill them, and you definitely don't want to push them. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Let's talk keys. So I think you already kind of mentioned it. Like now that now that keys are gone, I think you can still play slumber in key, right? Yep. Or there's yes. Uh yeah yeah. Yep. Which again is a good one. It's restricted. I I've always called it spend a glory get a glory. Yep. So sure. I don't think anything changes with that one. I, I agree. So I've been running with just just a single key, and uh, I I think there's I think there's plenty of room. Your your glory ceiling is lower but maybe you're more likely to get there because you have more usable upgrades in there. Uh, it may be a tougher question, specifically uh, Castle Mac Coach on Twitter was asking, you know, what do, what do uh, goblins put in if they can't put in a huge amount of keys? Uh, that's, or, I mean, or, that's a great question for the goblins because like, really what carried them through a lot of those matchups was having just a random, I get four or six glory from not doing anything. So... That's kind of tough um, mm-hmm. for them specifically that the keys have left because they they really really relied on their keys for their objective the objective play scale specifically so I don't really know where they're gonna go but uh, yeah I don't think there's a replacement at least there's no clean one right now so um, let's go on to another Jeff Osborne question here so you, having hold objective well let me delay I think we're we're not. Generally, we think uh, that just to hold the single objectives, there's they're just not efficient enough. They're taking up too much space with, for not enough return on glory. Um, oh yeah, they're... those hold objective one through five are just not playable. Yeah. unfortunately. Talk to me. Have you ever experimented with the with going the other direction on the uh, tactical tactical genius one through five and three through five? Hold three, but uh, hold specific three. Yeah, one, two, three, and three, four, five. I believe are the two, and yeah. I've considered it, um, but. The reality is, like, I think I'd just play our only way out mm-hmm. before doing that. So you're like, you're fighting with a lot of. Uh, at the time, you were fighting with a lot of more efficient uh, objectives. Just I, escalations now in my deck. Something's got to go. You know. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. So I, I think I think the answer is then if say you've got supremacy, our only way out, and three tactical supremacies, you got five. Almost half your deck is is taken up with those, and they're high enough glory. Glory ceilings high enough already. You don't have to go digging for more by by trying these particularly difficult tactical genius cards. Um, right, and you also want to. You also, when you're deck building, you have to consider that you want some number of score immediately. So mm-hmm. like, I like to have at least five. That's kind of like my limit. That's my minimum that I want to have. So I got five of those, then I've got five of these hold objective cards, and I got two flex spots ish. Mm-hmm. Sure. And that's usually, you know, escalation and something else. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think if you just look at the math of it, if you if you have less than three score immediately, you cannot score your entire objective deck, right? You know, because you you can score three at the end of round one, three at the end of round two, three at the end of round three. That's nine. So yep. you need at least three, probably more, to optimize that. Uh, talk to me. Where where are you turning for? So of the seven objective cards that are not. Uh, revolving around holding objectives, where are you turning? Uh, where are you looking for those? It sounds like Escalation, that's a pretty passive one that can just uh, yep. help you keep um, pace. Keep Them Guessing is awesome, mm-hmm. and it will continue to be awesome all the way through uh, Beast Grave. Then you've got uh, Calculated uh, no, not calculated Risk, obviously. <laughs> that one's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. <laughs> um charge while on guard can't ever remember the name change of tactics change of tactics yeah change of tactics cover ground shortcut things that you're you're able to score while still executing your game plan so when you're hitting paths obviously you shortcut sudden appearance obviously you get shortcut uh fainway and uh inescapable vengeance score cover ground yeah and uh you have two different ploys that uh get you change of tactics or get a, a uh guard token on you without having to take an action that scores you change of tactics Mm -hmm. um so it's like all the things you've listed here change of tactics and uh keep them guessing technically will require at some point an attack because the one requires a charge and uh keep them guessing will require you to either attack or charge on top of three things that don't involve rolling dice Um, it's a it's a good thing that ready for action counts as an attack action. Yeah. So uh, that, and then what I've found also has been handy for keep them guessing is um, the there's the uh, uh, night hunt specific. It's the uh, uh, endless malice. So you can yep. charge 
And sometimes I'll charge with somebody who's almost certainly going to miss, like uh, the guy with the board for an arm or the helmet head. <laughs> uh, so they're going to miss their charge, and then I can react with that, maybe score treacherous foe, uh, and then uh, and then when they react, that second attack is an attack rather than a charge. And so you exactly. can check two off, and then you've got that much more freedom for the rest of the round. Yep, there's a, there's a lot of like just hidden efficiencies in the deck that allow keep them guessing to go off. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, it's something that is uh, good in both uh, both the ghosts and the uh, the goblins deck. Um, they can they can do the uh, uh, charge, scurry somebody, or they can do the special action to move and scurry somebody else. And so they they mm-hmm. they can they've got their own efficiencies for that. So I think that's a, a card that. Uh, does well for both um so. yeah and they've got that upgrade that lets an adjacent goblin shoot after the other guy shoots or something so you can charge one up he shoots the other one takes a shot mm-hmm. you know they will get you both there's yeah. a lot of little hidden efficiencies all over the place so do you consider when you're filling out the rest of your your deck um i've i've kind of crept with mine a little more towards its whole objective and then kind of controlly for the rest like uh, enough stuff that you know keep my guys from dying or keep you from executing. Uh, I think the other way is, uh, include stuff like, for instance, let's, let's throw out a, a basic one, like great strength. Is that, a, is that an upgrade that you consider, uh, putting in the deck? Uh, it is in the deck. Yeah. Okay. I have great strength and I have also uh shade glass dagger. Mm. Just, Ooh. yeah, like there's, it just turns your chain rasps into potentially killing every model in the game. So, Sure. So I think I, I, I don't think, think to answer your question, I don't think that uh, I think I'd call it more mid range. You're not looking to fully protect all your guys, and you're not looking to go full aggro. You're looking to have like a compromise in between, so you can protect some of your guys while you're able to go aggro with the others. Mm-hmm. Because, I, I often play very aggressive, especially when I don't have the board. Sure. So I, I think uh, I think, and it makes sense. Like what we're what we're talking about is that you, only part of your deck can really honestly be devoted to holding objectives you you've got to do something with the rest of it and mm-hmm. um that's that's probably where a lot of the flavor a lot of the differences between uh any given hold objective deck is happening how you're trying how you're trying to spend the rest like it's you're going to have supremacy you're going to have our only way out you're probably going to have tactical supremacies there's going to be some number of keys until they rotate um what do you do with the rest is is how as pe- how people change that up um and there's uh for me, where I've I've pulled more and more of the aggro stuff out, I've noticed some things it does is it uh, ices out a ton of people's defensive upgrade. Like they, uh, that's fine. Go ahead, put extra wounds on that. I'm not gonna, I'm not attacking him anyway. You know, um, right? So they're... Right. In the in the Molog matchup, you're never attacking Molog, so you sometimes have some dead upgrades. But at the same time, you sometimes get to have somebody kill a squig somewhere that sure. you weren't going to kill otherwise. Yeah. Are there any upgrades that? Uh, uh, so you already talked about deathly fortitude, sudden growth, um, going down to just sudden growth. Are there, are there any ones that, um, that you think are automatic? And then what, what do you find are the ones that are just kind of on the edge, like coming in and out of your deck? I uh, can't decide whether to keep or not. Uh, the, the new acrobatic that was in, uh, power unbound, um, get the extra dodge dice. Yeah. Spectral armor, I think. Yeah. That's the one spectral okay. armor. All right. Yeah. Um, so that one I think is pretty automatic. Um, obviously, Inescapable Vengeance, Fainway Crystal. Fainway Crystal is huge and probably should be restricted, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those are really the only ones that are like set in stone that you really need to have, especially once you consider the rotation. Sure. Um, what's your feeling? Do you uh, do you put um, Howling Vortex, that uh, movement spell from the Briar Queen? Yeah, it's the only spell that I play. Yeah. Um, mostly because I don't like the fact that if she dies, you lose the access to the card. Because constantly, it, it never fails. Whenever the Briar Queen dies, Inspired Command and Howling Vortex show up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Right behind them is uh, is Inescapable Vengeance. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. So some, sometimes you're holding three cards that are absolutely dead. Yeah. I I threw Howling Vortex out at one point because I was I, I exactly that was happening. I I get her killed. Uh, and then I draw it or, uh, or like two or three games in a row, I failed the cast and I'm like, ah, what is this taking up space in my deck? This is awful. Um, but, uh, 
but yeah, it's just yeah. so powerful that uh, it's it's yeah, pretty. You, you really need it. It's a uh, five distractions in one or something. In a lot of cases, gets them off your objectives. You can push them into lethal hexes, which will kill models, especially if they're playing shard gale things like that. Like the, it's one of the best cards in the deck. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it doesn't go off, and then sometimes you draw after she dies. But yeah. you know, the Maybe. actual best card in the deck is probably last chance. Oh yeah, mm, probably. Yeah. I yeah. I still can't fathom why that one's not restricted. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like Soul Trap or whatever the other one is, and they're like they're restricted, and they're the same fifty fifty and take an upgrade slot, which costs you a glory. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great point. Uh, it's it's nuts, and I I always feel so much more comfortable when I've got it in hand. And man, you wanna you wanna break somebody's heart, have them spend you know, three activations cutting through a uh, sudden growth chain rasp or something like they missed and they hit <laughs> and they finally did enough damage and then you last chance it. So, last chance. Yeah. The uh, the only thing I'm going to say now that last chance is rotating is that even when it goes off, your opponent is allowed to still push your model. Yeah, I found I've had to and remind people a lot about that. Yeah. No one has ever pushed the model that has last chance, which has saved me a ton of glory. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's surprise. It's right there in the FAQ. Like it's it's not. Uh, I mean, I guess it's hidden because it's in an FAQ, but it's not like it's uh, ambiguous or anything. It's right there. So. Right, right. It was never really a question. Like the model, it just didn't die. It yeah. still it took zero damage. You definitely won. You can still push them, whatever. But I don't think I've ever once been pushed. Oh man. After using last chance. I so when I've been playing as practice, assuming that people would know to do it, I've been reminding people just because they're practice games i've been reminding them uh, yep so i've been i've been trying to undo that i guess uh but uh just so i could try it on hard mode but yeah um one upgrade i thought was uh that i this is uh a zach newcomb recommendation i've been putting um the uh quickening greaves i've been putting yeah. quickening greaves in um it's a pick one each round push before you know who's going first or push after the final power step uh and so it's effect- effectively like a, an upgrade sidestep and sometimes it's like multiple sidesteps i found that to be great for uh helping sneak the the briar queen or a um or just getting that one more you know uh the the um ever hanged or your goblin uh or you know snurk or something they they got so close they just need one more well now they got it one more so. Yeah, it's definitely not a bad one. And the good news is you can get you can get it in each turn. You can put it at the end of turn one or whatever and still go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found as an upgrade, and this is just the nature of things. People forget that upgrades are on there. You know, it's not like you're trying to hide them, but um, they'll be sitting there. They think they like the board state, and then the power fit, power step ends. And you say, "All right, before you score, I'm going to take a step here." And right, uh, exactly. You see the shoulder slump. You're like, "Yeah, I got him." So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the only new upgrade that I've been playing is Crown of Avarice, yeah. and yeah. it's uh it's good and bad because once you put it on, like they're never attacking that model ever again, most yeah. likely. Yeah. But so it gives you something to put in a chain chain rasp and hide them on an objective and be like, all right, either I score my supremacy or I score a glory from you killing this thing. So. Mm. Yeah. Uh. It. I. I I had post no constitution in there as a uh, like oh this is a reaction it'll increase survivability and then I finally realized like why why in the world do I not have crown of avarice on there so um, on my short list of cards that I wish were rotating that weren't that uh, that's right up there so <laughs> it's brand new <laughs> yeah I know <laughs> uh, there's always so, the bar yeah well I don't know we'll see but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I that's a that's a great one. That's a survive. I mean, it's effectively a survivability upgrade. So um, I found people either power through, in which case you got a two glory swing, or they don't, in which case you get your three glory for supremacy. So it's right. a it's a juicy one. Um, <clears throat> any other uh, be it objectives, gambits, or or upgrades that uh, you you think are worthy of consideration that we haven't talked about? Uh. No, not that we hadn't talked about. I think Shadowed Step will show up a bit more now that you have, you still want to score a shortcut and you can't play uh, Hidden Paths. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I think pretty much everything. They're very you're really not losing too much other than the obvious stuff out of the deck, which is very nice. Yeah, I, I thought a little bit about uh, having Shadowed Step and then you know specifically 
putting an objective in in uh, no man's land, but it it's not a good call. Like you you want it in a more defensible spot, so um, abandon that pretty quick. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, let's take a look see if there's any questions that we have uh, have not tapped on. Uh, I think we've talked. So we've talked about some of the things that uh, obviously last episode we talked uh, rotation. Um, Matthew Martins asking uh, what. So you're going to lose keys. You're going to lose some of your tactical supremacies. Uh, on the flip side, other people are losing shard gill and aggro stuff is losing some things. So uh, real hard question to answer, but where, what, what are you looking for uh, objective, hold objective style decks to gain back in order to kind of be relevant? Or do you think they're um, in a good place still? Well, I think after the rotation, they're going to be back to being in a pretty bad spot. You lose our only way out. Um, you're going to lose two of the tactical supremacies, uh, one, two, and three, four. Mm -hmm. The good news is I imagine they'll print another two. So we'll be back up to four at some point during the season, which is really what I'm looking forward to. Hopefully that, that happens. There's, you know, at least, what, seven more or something they could print. Sure. Yeah, you might see like one, three, and four, five or something like that, right? So. Right, exactly. And as long as there's some overlap with the ones that exist... That's great. It's perfect. You, you can't print one that doesn't have overlap with the existing ones. So, uh, so right now we have one four and two five. So, mm -hmm. like, say they print one three, which would make a lot of sense. Then you get to do, or three five would make more sense. But even then, you have some overlap. Mm -hmm. um, I think we mostly covered. We hit Jeff Osborne's question. Uh, Matthew Martin got him. Uh, Castle Mac coach David Wills. Uh, he asked if you can play aggressive objective, and I think I think that you that kind of describes what what you tend to play, particularly if you're, if you're in the position where you quote unquote won boards and you're, you're having to go pursue other ones. Um, so I think, I think the answer sounds like yes to that. Right. Uh, and, uh, he was also asking how to tell the difference of, of Warman if they're, if they're good for objective play. And I think you laid out your criteria for that pretty, pretty concisely right at the top. So, yep. um, what, uh, let me wrap this up with uh, a, a couple points. What, uh, what do you consider to be, uh, the bad matchups right now for hold objective play. Just if we're pretending we're going into rotation, then I the really only bad bad matchup is uh, Gundorfs. Yeah, uh, it's just they yeah. they this, they threaten so far. They mm -hmm. threaten so far. Um, yeah, a lot of people say that Molog was the, was a mistake. I think the Dwarves were a mistake. Just having every model with a gun, a range three gun, is really problematic for of war bands. Sure. And not just objective play, but specifically for objective play, because they just threaten you from six hexes, hexes away to knock you. You not even kill you, just knock you off an objective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I found, and we, I, I kind of missed this earlier on, but placing uh, when placing objectives, particularly against um, warbands that have range, be it uh, the profiteers or be it uh, uh, curse breakers who who might have storm sire th throwing spells around, uh, I'll often try to place them further than three apart from each other, so they can't. They can't stand on one and shoot somebody on another. Uh, sure. Uh, make a move, but uh, that's that's a, that's what you're talking about. Or uh, or make it so they can't see one from the other. Uh, make it so it's real difficult to stand in one spot and see more than one. Because the worst is to have a turret dwarf have Lund or something Lund or or curse breaker just standing and not even having to move, just shot after shot, blowing blowing person after person off the objectives yeah so. spoiler alert for whenever john he, he recorded a both of our matches actually so whenever he puts those up you can you can just watch my heartbreak when he when he played <laughs> shard gale then hidden past iron hail upgraded iron oh, hail no. with his gun and then killed two chain rasp on objectives oh, at, gosh, in the yeah. fourth activation of turn one it was just oh, no. it was the absolute nightmare scenario yeah yeah it's like all right well that's the game yeah, far and away, that's what I've, I've struggled with the most is playing against uh, profiteers. Um, w let's say let's say you're in the profiteers matchup. Are you, you still you still in that matchup would want to lose boards? You still want the three, right? Yeah, there's not. Yeah, you just you um, you really turn into an aggro deck. You just have to rely on the Briar Queen and the Everhang to just kill everything and Varclav to a lesser extent if you can get him inspired. You just sure. you just need to kill him. Yeah. Um, my usual is to spend a lot of resources, get the Briar Queen to take a, an attack on Lund or Iron Hail to try and uh, chop out that part, you know, so they can't score what armor or get the hints or whatever it is they're trying to score off those, uh, but then just miss and then 
being being a world of hurt. But, yeah, my, um, if your if your dice just turn sour, like that's one of the upsides of playing is you don't have to worry about your dice. But then when you have to rely on them to just play that matchup, they can go very south very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there outside of the outside of the profiteers? Is there anything else um, that uh, that you find to be a more challenging matchup than others? I don't really think there's anything that I, is on the level of profiteers. Just having everything with range threatening range six or whatever. Um, Chris mm. Prickers is obviously very good. Um, they have a lot of spells that they can cast that deal one damage or little AOE one damage or things like that. They can just be a little annoying. Mm. Just things with with significant ranges and spells fall in that bucket, especially when all your guys are spellcasters. So, uh, but to that effect, tell me tell me how you feel about the monologue matchup because I uh, I've done better against it than i thought but I, and i expect it to be a little i mean it, i've it's i find it plenty challenging but uh Malag, especially inspired comes in and then can make a lot of attacks is it is it that accuracy is still an issue for him or what's uh how do you feel about the Malag matchup if Malag hits average dice you are probably slightly favored if Malag rolls above average you just lose yeah. Yeah. Like if if he's killing or if he hits the ready for action, whatever the ready for action and inspiration strike start. Yeah. There's just mm-hmm. again, there's nothing you can do. You just kind of get crushed under the weight of dice. All your models die in one hit. You would just get last chance one time if you draw it. Other than that, he's just playing whack a mole with all your guys. Yeah. I think that's covered most of what Phil. You got anything else we want to ask the ask the master while he's here? Uh. Yeah. So. Um, so this is sort of a looking forward type question, which is sort of why I didn't want to insert it in these sort of previous, uh, conversations. Um, so we, we've seen that the, uh, Mourn Flight have some objective based play, but it's very different from what we've been seeing previously, where it's stuff that looks like... At the end of an activation, you can score these for holding an even and an odd objective, or for moving through two objectives in one move, you can score um, something. Do you think we'll see more things like that? And what does that effectively mean for objective play going forward, if that is going to be uh, a new trend, that there's going to be faster scoring with objectives and stuff that's maybe not tied around just sit on top of this objective i think anything that makes the objectives matter more is a good direction for the game um just a a hugely a huge better or huge improvement for the game from where it is right now um so i'd I'd love to see things go in that direction just any any way you want to interact with them as long as you're interacting with the objectives i'd like to see that happen um though i don't really want to see like an extraordinarily passive play style where you just stand in your deployment zone and just run across objectives the three objectives you get like that would be way too boring so i don't want to see it go too far but i'd like to see it go far enough where at least uh the play style is more represented than it is now sure yeah i where you still want people to have to salt something else into the deck not just be pure hold but it'd be nice to you know be able to like like the mourn flight do uh get some score immediately is you know, uh, especially if some of the attack supremacies are rotating out or take a while to come back in or something like that. What are we? Um, all right. Well, uh, anybody got anything else left to say? Dean, any last uh, thoughts about uh, hold objective here? No, I think I covered it all. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I want to say thanks to you uh, for being on this ep. Really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for taking the time. And uh, maybe. Uh, Maybe we'll uh, see you at at the very least. We'll see you at uh, we'll see you at Adepticon. Um, although uh, hoping for my win record, it's uh, not across the table. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can get in touch with us at WTHCast on Twitter or whatthehexcast at gmail dot com. Uh, you can always check out all the Mortal Realms content at themortalrealms.com. dot com. That includes Dogs of Warcry, our uh, our new Warcry. Uh, podcast it includes the the main cast the mortal realms that's been going on for quite a quite a while um we'd always appreciate it if you'd uh, take some time to drop us a review on the listening platform of your choice we are available on stitcher and spotify now i got all that sorted out so uh, if that's your jam go listen on that uh our recommended listening for this episode is going to be hold on hold on by nico case 
That's off of Fox Confessor Brings the Flood. Uh, for What the Hex, I've been Davey. This is Phil. And this is Dean. So actually, when I was saying four models push, five models push earlier. So just, you know, just do a really bad voiceover every time I say four (laughs) earlier in the episode. Five.